The Bible contains a story. And in this story, there's a central storyline. This storyline is one of salvation. The story begins with the perfect creation of the world and mankind. The story quickly shifts to the introduction of sin into the world with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. From that point forward, the story looks toward the Savior who would come into the world and redeem mankind from his sin. And then the Savior, Jesus Christ, comes and lives on earth, offering his life as a ransom sacrifice. Finally, after the Savior ascends into heaven, the story focuses on preparing for the Savior's final coming at the end of the world. As the more than 40 human authors reveal this God-given story, we read about various characters who are woven into the Bible story. These individuals were real-life characters who each had an impact on the story in some way. Some of them were faithful to God and helped him accomplish his purposes. Some of them were unfaithful to God and tried to overthrow or rebel against his purposes. Yet regardless of whether they were good or evil, one benefit of studying the Bible's story is to learn lessons from these individuals. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it tells us the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there are real, living, and powerful examples of men and women who have lived their lives on this earth, providing us with examples that will help us live our lives for the Lord. Therefore, not only does the Bible contain instructions and commandments that, if we follow them, will help us to be pleasing to God, but the Bible also contains powerful examples of men and women who have either obeyed or disobeyed God. So throughout the Bible story, we observe many case studies, if you will, that will help us live life in a way that pleases God, learning from both examples of those who are pleasing to God and those who are displeasing to God. We have in the Bible hundreds of individual case studies of people in various circumstances with various backgrounds, with various strengths and various weaknesses, with various abilities, with various opportunities, and so on, who are all making various choices regarding whether to follow the Lord or not. In this lesson... We want to observe how we can benefit from a study of Bible characters. I would like us to observe some examples in the Bible when individuals referenced other Bible characters and stories. I would also like us to make our own applications regarding the use of Bible characters. Throughout this study, we'll be observing four specific ways in which Bible characters can be used according to the Scriptures. First, We can benefit from Bible characters because Bible characters illustrate Bible truths. Certainly, the Bible is composed of many truths that we need to accept and apply to our lives in order to be acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, it's not enough. It it, it is enough, I should say, if God says a thing. However, when there is a story that is associated with it to demonstrate the point, it often becomes more memorable and is better understood. So Bible writers, particularly New Testament writers, would appeal to Bible stories in connection with the point that they were making. We go to Romans chapter 4. In Romans chapters 1 through 3, Paul has been demonstrating the fact that all men, both Jews and Gentiles, have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Now, in Romans 4, he's demonstrating that all people, both Jews and Gentiles, can be justified by faith in God apart from the works of the old law. For instance, they can be saved without circumcision. This truth was stated in Romans 3 in verse 26, where it says, "...to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
So to illustrate this Bible truth about justification by faith in Jesus Christ, Paul appeals to the example of Abraham, a man of faith and one who had great credibility with the Jews. And he points out that Abraham was justified by faith and not by his own meritorious work, that is, not not even by circumcision. And though you can read the entirety of Romans chapter 4, just consider a couple of passages from this chapter. In, In the first four verses, it says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And then you consider in verses 9 through 12, after stating the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works in verse 6, in verses 9 through 12, the writer says, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had, he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who also walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Again, Paul attempts to get these Jewish and Gentile Christians to understand that salvation is available to everyone, regardless of nationality, through faith in Christ Jesus. And this would have been a powerful point. Particularly, this would have been a great help to Jewish Christians to recognize that it was not the physical practice of circumcision that made them acceptable to God, but they must have faith in Jesus Christ. Next, we go to James chapter 2, and I want to look at verses 21 through 25. Now, in the larger context of this passage, in verses 14 through 26, James is writing to identify the importance and necessity of works, works of obedience for salvation. This is contrary to the ideas about being saved by faith only that are so common today. In fact, James teaches that Faith without these works of obedience is a dead faith and implies that a dead faith is unable to save. Now, these statements of fact are strong enough, but James demonstrates the foolishness of faith that does not have works by appealing to the examples of Abraham and Rahab here in this, in this section in James chapter 2. In verses 21 through 25, he says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by by works, faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Both of these examples in the Old Testament demonstrate that individuals are not counted righteous in the sight of God only by believing in Him. Instead, they demonstrate faith in action, which is the kind of true faith that Paul spoke about in Romans chapter 4. Both of these individuals had such confidence in God that they were willing to take certain actions which demonstrated that confidence. Abraham had the necessary works of obedience which demonstrated his faith when he was willing to offer his son, his only son, on the altar as God had commanded him. And then Rahab also had faith 
which compelled her to help the spies who had been sent into Jericho. Now, please understand that James is talking about works of obedience, which are necessary for salvation. While Paul, in Romans chapter 4, was talking about meritorious works, that is, works to earn your own salvation, particularly works of the old law, these two passages do not contradict each other. They are in perfect harmony. So both of these individuals demonstrate this truth that faith without works is dead, just as James teaches here in this section. Next, another passage from the book of James. In James chapter 5, verses 13 through 18, James teaches about the great power of prayer and the place that it has in Christians praying for one another. Now, the statement that James makes about prayer are wonderful and they're encouraging to us. However, please notice how James uses a character from the Old Testament as a case study, so to speak, about the power of prayer. In James chapter 5 and verses 13 through 18, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. So James states that the effective, fervent prayer of, the right, of a righteous man avails much. And then he appeals to the example of Elijah, who James says was a righteous man. Specifically, James references the power of Elijah's prayer, that it would not rain, and says that it did not rain for three years and six months. And then James references the power of Elijah's prayer that it would rain, and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced fruit. You can read 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18 for more information on this account. So the Old Testament example that's given here by James powerfully demonstrates the truth that prayer is truly effective and accomplishes much when there is a righteous individual who is praying. Next, to see that Bible characters can be used to illustrate Bible truths, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6. Now, in the context of this passage, Peter is writing to Christian women concerning their God-given responsibilities to both their Christian or non-Christian husbands. Specifically, he instructs that women be submissive to their husbands for their conduct to be chaste and for their beauty to be the inward beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. In fact, he even demonstrates how that the unbelieving husbands of these Christian women who conduct themselves in this way may even be one to the Lord without a word being said. And now Peter demonstrates this sort of conduct God wants from women by appealing to the holy women and Sarah. Notice 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It says, For in this manner in former times the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. These women had God's approval in their conduct toward their husbands. So this is a powerful illustration to demonstrate the kind of submissiveness and purity that God expects from Christian women today. And then we go on in 1 Peter chapter 3 and go down to verses 18 through 22 as Peter's making a larger point about the fact 
that Jesus Christ has suffered and died so that we could be saved from our sins. Peter now gives us specific information about baptism in this context. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, he states that baptism now saves us. Now, Peter could just make the statement that baptism now saves us. However, he illustrates this truth by discussing that many who are now in prison had been preached to during the days of Noah, but were disobedient. And in contrast to those who were disobedient and destroyed, Noah and his family were saved through water. So notice the text with me. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, that in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So many perished for their disobedience, Peter says. However, eight souls were saved through water. And likewise, Peter says, baptism now saves us. So if we will listen to God and be baptized, we can be saved from the wrath of God. This truth is powerfully demonstrated through this Old Testament story of Noah and the flood. Next, I want us to look at 1 John the third chapter, in verses 10 through 15. The Bible contains many instructions to love. In fact, Christians are taught to love all men, their earthly family members, their neighbors, their Christian brethren, and even their enemies. Specifically, in 1 John 3, verses 10 through 15, John discusses the responsibility of Christians to love one another and appeals to the example of Cain, who demonstrated his hatred toward his brother Abel. The passage says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. But as not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, certainly no Christian would want to be classified alongside Cain. Cain was a murderer. He was someone who truly hated his brother. However, John demonstrates the truth that those who do not love their brethren are just as sinful as Cain, saying that they are murderers and that they, because they are murderers like Cain, will not have eternal life. Certainly, this has just been an overview of each one of these passages. However, please reflect on how all of the, how all of the truths that are established in these passages can be made more firm in our minds because of the illustrations that are given of past Bible characters. However, these are not the only truths that can be made more firm by considering Bible characters. As we study the Bible, we can have many truths established by looking to Bible characters. Next, not only can Bible characters be used to illustrate Bible truths, but they can also be used to give warnings to those who are living. In fact, it is absolutely foolish if we refuse to learn lessons from those who have lived before us. Let's look at Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 through 39. Now, in the context, in verses 36 through 51, 
It teaches about Jesus' impending return, saying that the time of his coming is unknown to anyone on earth. Therefore, Jesus instructs that each individual must make proper preparation for his coming and remain ready at all time. Now, this warning is very powerful in and of itself. However, Jesus appeals to an Old Testament example to demonstrate his point about preparedness. In Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Just as Jesus' coming will catch many unprepared, the flood in Noah's day also caught many unprepared. And during the time leading up to the flood, even though people were being warned, they simply refused to heed the warnings and continued living for their own indulgences. Then, when the time of the flood came, all of those who were unprepared were destroyed. Again, Jesus uses this powerful example from the Old Testament scriptures to warn those who are living today on the earth to make preparations for his return. He warns us all, even today, that he is coming at a time that is unknown to us and that those who are caught unprepared for his coming will be eternally punished in hellfire. Next, as we think about benefiting from Bible characters, now Bible characters can be used to warn, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and look at the first 11 verses. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is warning Christians, those who have taken part in God's goodness, to take heed so that they do not fall away from God's grace, verse 12, particularly in connection with idolatry. In fact, Paul promises that there is There is a way of escape that has been provided from all temptation, emphasizing that others have experienced the same kinds of temptation that we experience and that God will not allow us to be tempted beyond our abilities to endure, verse 13. However, please notice how Paul appeals to the example of the Israelites in order to warn Christians about turning away from God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the, in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All, and all ate, excuse me, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul says that many of the Israelites who were God's chosen people in the Old Testament times had partaken of the goodness of God. However, many of them chose to turn away from God, and they all experienced the consequences when this occurred. Each one of the examples that Paul mentions, which we'll not discuss in detail, would bring to mind a different story from the Old Testament scriptures. Many, Paul says, died in the wilderness before entering the land of Canaan, Because of their rebellion against God, some committed fornication and were destroyed. Some tested God and were destroyed. Some complained and were destroyed. Therefore, in verse 11, as we saw, 
Paul specifically states that these things all happened as examples for us so that we might be admonished not to rebel against God and experience such destruction. Next, in 2 Peter chapter 2, in verses 4 through 11, we want to notice how Peter appeals to Bible characters to warn as well here in this text. Now, 2 Peter chapter 2 begins with a warning about false teachers in verses 1 through 3. Peter warns that there will be many false teachers, just as there have been false prophets before. These false teachers will deceive the hearts of many and lead them to eternal destruction. It's in this context that Peter now teaches the ability of God to deliver the godly, as well as his ability to punish the wicked. Notice 2 Peter 2 verses 4 through 11 with me. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord." Now consider that Peter provides a number of examples to substantiate his claim. He gives encouragement of how God delivered Noah and Lot from their situations. However, he also warns that God will punish the wicked by giving the examples of angels who sinned, the ancient world of the ungodly during the time of Noah, and the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So as you consider Peter's warning about false teachers, consider yourself warned that those who rebel against the ways of God will be punished by the Almighty God who was able to punish those who were mentioned here in this text. The specific warnings that are given in each of these passages need to be applied today. However, these are not the only warnings that we can take from examples of Bible characters. There are many warnings that can be observed through studying the lives, especially of those who were not faithful to God. We must choose the path of wisdom and learn the lessons of disobedience from such people. Next, not only can we use Bible characters to have Bible truths illustrated to us or to warn us, but they can also be used to encourage us to live faithful lives. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is often called the Faith Hall of Fame because of all of the men and women who are identified in this text as living faithful lives to God. Now, in context, Hebrews 10 has just warned Christians about falling away from serving God. And chapter 11 then provides examples of faith that they should have imitated. This chapter demonstrates how many individuals put their complete faith, their complete trust in God, and were obedient to whatever he instructed of them. Abel offered an acceptable offering to God by faith, verse 4. Noah moved with godly fear and prepared an ark by faith, verse 7. Abraham acted on the promises of God and left his homeland by faith, verses 8 through 12. Abraham also offered his only son on the altar by faith, verses 17 through 19. Joseph gave specific instructions concerning his bones by faith, verse 22. 
Moses refused to be counted as an Egyptian and willingly suffered with God's people by faith, verses 24 through 28. The Israelites passed through the Red Sea by faith, verse 29. The walls around the city of Jericho fell after they were encircled by the Israelites by faith, verse 30. Others, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, verses 33 and 34. Still others, it says, were sawn in two, tormented, tortured, imprisoned, stoned, killed with the sword, etc., 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 all by faith, verses 35 through 38. Now, after all of these great examples of faith, consider what's said in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The statement made in verse 1 applies to the examples that were given in chapter 11. The word witnesses, as I understand it, has reference to spectators at an athletic competition. Specifically, we are the ones who are competing in this athletic event. We are the ones who are trying to win the race of life, so to speak, for God. These witnesses or spectators are in the crowd. They're cheering us on to victory. So as we run the race of faith, we can look around us and see the great faith of Noah, Abraham, Moses, Joshua, etc., etc., etc. Therefore, we can gain great encouragement from them and press on to live faithful lives for ourselves. And then we look to the ultimate Bible character, and that's Jesus Christ, who has made our victory possible. Next, I want to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, in verses 21 through 25 specifically. Now, in the larger context of this passage, in verses 18 through 25, Peter gives instructions to those who are servants. Specifically, he instructs them to be, in verse 18, submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. He goes on to describe how that even though they may be beaten unjustly, they need to continue to be submissive to their masters and be obedient to the commandments of God. As Peter gives them these unpleasant instructions, he points them to the examples, to the example of Jesus' suffering, who is the perfect example. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21 through 25, Peter says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So as these individuals were facing unpleasant and unjust consequences for doing what was right, Peter encourages them by the example of Jesus Christ. After all, he suffered and died unjustly, having committed absolutely no wrong during his life. Surely, with such a great example, these Christians could be encouraged to suffer whatever would be associated with living a faithful Christian life. Certainly, these specific examples ought to serve as an encouragement to us today. However, these are not the only examples that we can take from the Bible to encourage us. 
There are many examples throughout the scriptures that we can observe in our study that will encourage us to live lives for the Lord. And finally, not only can Bible characters be used to illustrate Bible truths, to warn, and to encourage, but they can generally be used to learn from their example examples, whether positive examples of faithful living or negative examples of wicked living. Notice Romans 15 and verse 4 with me. While it's certainly true that we live under Christ's new law and better covenant today, and that we do not live under the Old Testament law, it is also true that we can benefit a great deal from those things which were written before in the Old Testament. Romans 15 verse 4 says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Therefore, we must recognize that Christian living is aided by the study of the Old Testament. While we must not look to the Old Testament to find a system of law to govern our actions today, we can be greatly benefited from studying its pages. It will teach us great lessons about God, about faithful living, about sin, and many other things. Certainly, a central component of studying the Old Testament scriptures will be a study of the people who took part in its story. And then again, I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, once more. Again, the characters of the Old Testament and the New Testament are beneficial for us. Again, look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Some of these Bible characters are positive examples we should imitate. Some of these characters are negative examples, which serve as a warning about their wickedness. Regardless of the specific Bible character, we can learn something from each one that will be beneficial to us in living faithful Christian lives. There's certainly much to learn from the Bible characters we read about in the pages of the Scriptures. Study will demonstrate lessons about prayer from Hannah, lessons about faithfulness from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, lessons about courage from Daniel, lessons about overcoming temptation from Joseph, lessons about overcoming trials from Job, Lessons about rebelling against God from Korah. Lessons about repentance from David, etc., etc., etc. And it will certainly do us a great deal of good to study these examples. Now, as we close our study, let's all determine to learn from the examples contained within the pages of God's Word. They have all been written and preserved for a purpose. We can imitate the good examples and learn from the bad ones. We can learn about God's dealings with people throughout times and his dealings with sin. We can learn about people who faced things that are similar to the circumstances that we are in and who struggled with the same temptations we struggle with. Remember from Hebrews 4 and verse 12 that God's word is living and powerful. Let's always remember that his word has life-changing implications for us if we will heed the warnings and obey the commandments. Once more, God's Word is not composed of a fictional story. Rather, His Word is composed of a powerful and true message of salvation, and one that also contains instructions and is full of real-life case studies, so to speak, to help us live in a way that will please Him. When your life is over, will you be counted among those who have rejected God during their lives, or among among those who have been obedient to Him. Let's all study His Word diligently and make the proper applications of the things we read so that we will be counted among the faithful and spend eternal life in heaven with God together.